So in today's video, I will be talking about that how we will recognize, how we will identify OJPX and XPS spectrum. We know that in XPS spectrum, there are large number of peaks. The number of peaks basically define a three parameters. The first one is basically the chemical environment, the physical and chemical state of the sample, and instrumental contribution. For example, this is the XPS spectrum from lead. And we know that physically lead is a heavy element, so we have large number of peaks here. So these are basically photoelectron peaks and these are basically OJ peaks. If you look into the survey spectrum of tungsten, so the OJ peaks are basically located at a higher binding energy. For every element, in most of the cases, the OJ peaks are basically located at a higher binding energy. So this is one sign of the uh, OJ peaks that it will locate it at higher binding energy. It will never locate it here. In most of the cases, it will locate it at higher binding energy. The second important identification that it, it will not sharp, it will less intense. Look here, these are basically the, uh, the high resolution spectra uh, from this 4F here. And this is, I just take the high resolution of this from this OJ peaks here. And we can see that the peaks are not sharp peaks. These are just like hump here. So this is another identification. Let's discuss the OJ process briefly. We know in XPS basically we shine X-ray on the core electron. In the core electron emit, these are basically we call photoelectrons. Now here we have a vacancy. This vacancy has to fill. So let's suppose this is 1s orbital, this is 2s, this is 2p here. So there is a probability that this electron will fill the vacancy, this electron will fill, this electron will fill, or this electron will fill. So let's suppose this electron fill the vacancy here. When this electron fill the vacancy here, so another electron escape from the outer uh, shield, from the valence shield. And this electron is basically called OJ electron in order to conserve energy. So this vacancy can also be filled by this electron. So we will have two holes here. So this is also we call double double ionized uh, or we also call double vacancy here. So there is also a probability that electron might fill uh, from this uh, shield and uh, another electron emits came from here is an OJ electron. So these OJ peaks basically produce when the core electron vacancy filled by valence electron and subsequent emission of electron from the same layer. So there are four main OJ series observable. This is we call K double L, L double M, M double N, and N double O. Very, very important. So in small elements, we will only see this one. In bigger elements like the lead, we will see this one, this one, and a very, very big elements, we will see this series here. This K, L, M, N, and O are basically talk about the shell here. This is basically talk about the K here. This is talk about the L here. And then we have M here, we have N here, and we have O here. For instance, this K double L, L mean that initially the vacancy produced in the K shell here, correct? And the vacancy was filled by electron from the L shell here and another electron escape from the L shell here. So this is why it is represented by KLL. If you talk about this MNN, this means that initially vacancy is in M shell. That vacancy was filled by N shell and subsequently another electron emit from the N shell. This K double L is also represented by KVV. This means that initially the vacancy was in K shell and there is a double vacancy in the L shell here. Similarly, we can also represent this LMM like this, LVV. Similarly, MVV. Similarly, MVV. This paragraph is very important. We know that the kinetic energy of the OJ electron is approximately equal to the binding energy of the K shell electron minus the binding energy of that L shell electron and then the binding energy of that another shell electron. This means that the vacancy was in K shell. That vacancy was filled by electron from this L1, 
and then another electron escape from this L3 shell here. So this means that the kinetic energy is basically depend on the binding energy of these core electrons. And we know that the binding energy of this core electron is independent on the X-ray source here. This is very important concept. We know that the binding energy of these core electrons are independent on the type of X-ray. If you use aluminum or if you use magnesium, the binding energy will not change because the binding energy of these orbitals or shells are basically the intrinsic property of the material. So the kinetic energy of the OJ electron will not affect if we change the X-ray source here, very important. You see here, the kinetic energy of the OJ electron is also independent on the type of X-ray source used. But the loss sentence is very conceptually. If we use different X-ray source, the calculated binding energy for OJ electron will change. This is very conceptually. And if you know this with uh, confidence or with proof, so you can put your comments that how the binding energy of the OJ electron will change if we change the X-ray source.